The menu, surprisingly, stayed in the conversation for a while. I remember when this film was released, it wasn't incredibly heavily marketed or talked about, but a lot of my friends and colleagues went to watch it and spoke about it for quite some time after. The menu somehow managed to carve its place into pop culture. And still, now, a year later, people mention this seemingly random 2022 release more often than you'd expect, and some people even make video essays about it too. A simple explanation why this is so is that the menu is a good choice for all. It has a somewhat auteur feel, it says something, it's incredibly plot driven, so everyone can immerse themselves in the story and enjoy it. It's also a thriller and a mystery and that always helps. The tone is unique, everyone loves a good satire, and the film is just pretty good, so it makes sense that it would be enjoyed by most. But. I must say, while The Menu is definitely a solid film and a good film, it's not an incredible film. I'm not critiquing this film, I understand the irony of doing that, but I think it's fair to say that while the project is good, it's not incredibly great and doesn't blow you away. It's a very well made eat the rich satire, but it's not as elevated as Triangle of Sadness or Parasite. And I think what's really interesting here is that this film could have easily been really bad because, well, it's actually an incredibly difficult project to navigate. I'll break this down a bit later, but for now, let's begin where it all always begins. I think any issues that the menu may have, and I'm hesitant to even call these issues more things that prevent it from being as coherent as other pictures I mentioned, are in the structural foundations that are the script itself. The story is quite straightforward and consumable. Again, this isn't a bad thing, but something that limits the overall quality of the film. The script is a fantastic foundation for story building and narration through multiple different plot lines. And this is one reason why I think this film could have easily failed. A bad director would have struggled to connect all these storylines together and create something whole. What director Mark Mylod has achieved here is not only completely containing all the details of the script, but expanding them and effortlessly weaving them together. One other reason the menu could have been a mess is that this is actually a very difficult story to navigate. The exposition is heavy, the composition is difficult, the tone is unique. The directorial choices in a film like this are literally endless and a bad director could have and would have gotten lost in all of them. Mark Milo didn't, and it's the direction specifically that makes this film good. Why is that? And how did he do it? One key word that popped up more when looking at what audience members thought of this film was refreshing. The tone is key here. It's satire done well, but it's also mostly a one location script. It's mystery, but it's also kind of a horror. It's got dramatic elements, but it's also really funny. What school did you go to? The Brown. Student loans? No. I'm sorry, you're dying. Again, all conflicting tones, but weaving them together successfully, this has of course been done before, but it's not easy. That's what creates a refreshing film, as we constantly have projects trying to navigate all these things, but don't quite succeed. There are also cool details in the menu that give it an extra flair, such as the introductions of the foods, which also weaves in a nice culinary tone to the picture, once again adding and adding more variety of tone. And I must mention that the menu is also very well paced throughout. I think specific reveals happen very organically and at the right time, and the film never drags and knows when to go up and when to go down. So tone and pace, that's where Mark Milod first succeeds, and of course mastering those things is any director's job, 
And while the menu predispositions for more difficulty in those areas, that's not actually what makes the project really hard to navigate. One room. In this room, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven observable stories. Then we also have Margot's individual story arc, and we have the mystery of everything that's going on as well. And I do count that as a specific plotline. So that's a minimum of nine observable stories, all in one room, all at the same time. Now here is where a bad director gets lost. The script is actually very good at exposition and choosing which story to guide the movie through at which point. Most of these cuts, the ones jumping from table to table or to the kitchen, are actually there in script form already and not entirely directorial choices, which does help Mark Mylod not to get lost in the action. However, the cinematography and editing choices here are insane. It's infinite almost. You could do a cut to anyone at any point or any combination of people at any point. Perspective isn't an issue, because when shooting a group scene like this, there are a lot of angles that one could use that would work. You don't necessarily need to establish an angle beforehand, because the room itself functions as a sort of voyeuristic chamber, and you could also argue that any shot is from some character's perspective. This clearly works as the cinematography in the menu is incredibly colourful and full of variation, but never jarring. And of course, the script here helps in establishing which table to shoot at which time, but how do you pick the specific angle for that specific table? Do you want background action? Do you want to see the kitchen or the guests? Do you want to establish a line of dialogue or break the line to open up the room and get a more distinct creative choice? For a reaction shot, do you want a close-up of some character or a group reaction or a wide to reveal everything everywhere all at once? And in the editing room, if you've already shot a combination of all of these options, how do you choose which coverage to use when? Infinite choices. Knowing what to shoot when, and also what to choose in the editing room is where the director succeeds and exceeds here. As there are so many stories and so many options, this could have easily made no sense. The pace could have been off, the exposition could have been lacking, but these are the places where the menu actually succeeds greatly. And before you even begin to ask yourself what to shoot, you need to ask yourself who to place where. The blocking is fantastic here. For example, Margot and Tyler are placed here, in order to create a distance between Margot and Chef Slowick, as that's one of the key relationships in the story. Margot has her back to him too, a conscious choice made by Annie Taylor Joy. I remember saying to Mark, I feel like I need to have my back to Chef Slowick because that's the way that I feel about it and he should be a presence behind me and it's a choice. The back problems I now have. <laughs> <laughs> Margot is also placed behind this character as they have a pre-existing relationship too and it's interesting to put their backs to each other because that creates intrigue but also because that invites Margot to look back at him which moves the story forward. I would argue that the placement of the remaining three tables also matters. The critics are in the middle of it all and closest to the chefs. And the movie star and Felicity are in their own more isolated bubble here, as that's more of an intimate scene than the three tech bros just hanging out. All these things might seem trivial, but when staging a single location film, they matter greatly. There is a theatrical feeling to this movie. As Mark Milod himself has stated, the story is all performance within performance within performance, and there are multiple stages that it's all taking place on. One stage is the kitchen, one stage is the floor, and one stage is the overarching plot that combines the two. So, considering this performative feel of the film, the placement of the characters on these stages matters greatly and motivates details to the story. <laughs> Lastly, I want to take a look at exposition specifically and how the director handles that. 
We mentioned already that the script is actually very helpful here as it guides us through all the necessary information smoothly. Let's examine one sequence specifically to understand how the direction elevates this once again. The Taco Tuesday scene reveals laser engraved tortillas that expose something about some characters on each table. In the script, the progression of the sequence is expositionally solid. It begins with the critics table, which hints that something sinister is going on, then goes to the regulars, which furthers this idea, then goes to the tech bros, which once again furthers this idea and escalates the action, then moves to the movie star table to include them too, and then finally to Margot and Tyler for a climax of the sequence. In the film itself, however, the progression is a little different. We begin once again with the critics to introduce the same idea, something sinister is going on, and then cut to the regulars. But the reveal of that scene doesn't happen just yet. We're only introduced to their part of the story. Then we cut to Margot and Tyler to visually introduce them now and solidify the concept of the sequence. Then we cut to the movie star table to include them in the sequence now too at this moment. Then we go to the tech bros to escalate the action, then back to the regulars to conclude their portion of the story and combine the climax of that story with the climax of the tech bro story. Then we finally cut to Margot and Tyler to, again, climax the entire sequence. I'd argue this direction and editing is much better and serves the narrative really well. Instead of introducing each story and climaxing it in the same scene and then trying to climax the entire sequence with one specific scene, the filmed version introduces the concept of the entire sequence first through combining the setups of all individual scenes and then climaxes them all together too. This allows for the narrative to develop even better and allows for the sequence to flow really well. I think the menu is a fantastic example of what good direction specifically is. Of course, the script is solid, and the cinematography by Peter Deming is great, and the editing by Christopher Tellefson is great too, but it's Mark Milo's motivated directorial choices specifically that push the film forward. This is what having a vision really means. The director here knew what he wanted and coherently went ahead to achieve that. And the final product is a good film enjoyed by all. I rewatched the menu a few times in prep for this essay and I had a really fun time on each rewatch. It's not the best film of 2022, but it's a masterclass on navigating story through smart directorial choices. You know what I'd really like? Tell me. A cheeseburger. No, we can do a cheeseburger. Thank you so much for watching another video essay, guys. It really means the world. This essay concludes a series of four that we did in the month of December, and if you've been following along, I really, really do appreciate it. Please remember to like the video if you've enjoyed it, and maybe to even subscribe to the channel, and let me know any topics on any video essays you'd like me to touch upon in the future. And now, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year. Thank you all, I love you all.